welcome back to another A to Z. We've just um, done chest pain and now we're going to move on to some more my area. So we're going to do Crohn's disease, I think. That's right. And this time, viewers, we're going to switch role and I'm going to be the interviewer. Uh, and that's partly because I don't know a huge amount about Crohn's disease, to be honest, but I think you have some family interest in it. Is that right, James? Unfortunately, my sister has Crohn's, so I have a, a, you know, skin in the game, literally, on understanding the management, but also my general approach as a, as a medic, I like to be proactive. I want to try and pull people or stop people falling into the river rather than pulling them out of the river. And Crohn's inflammatory bowel disease may crucially important word there, maybe one of those diseases that we might be able to reduce the incidence of it coming. I'm not sure I could couch that any more, any more cautiously. Maybe you should start off by just telling myself and telling the viewers what Crohn's disease is, and then we'll get into the etiology, in other words, the cause of it. Well, Crohn's is an autoimmune disease, so links back to one of our earlier videos that we've already done, and it's essentially where the body is attacking itself. And Crohn's is an autoimmune disease that specifically affects the bowel, but with extra bowel symptoms. So Crohn's is part of a larger umbrella. We have inflammatory bowel diseases, of which we have Crohn's on one side, and you see ulcerative colitis on the other. If you had to choose between the two, you want to have ulcerative colitis, because that affects just your bowel. With Crohn's disease, we have a phrase for it at medical school, it affects from mouth to anus. All the way through, you can have a problem, you can have inflammations, you can have ulcers. Whereas with ulcerative colitis, it's just the bowel, and if everything really falls apart on what we do to help, you can take the bowel out. Whereas we can't for want of a better phrase, core a patient out with Crohn's disease. We have to manage it medically. Tell me a bit more about the perianal type of Crohn's. I remember when I was a house officer in, in Nottingham before the war, a long time ago, um, I saw several young patients with perianal Crohn's. And I must admit, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. So tell me more about that. Well, first off, you need to get a better class of enemy. Um, actually, again, I, I, I've had a really good medical week at work, um, as in I have seen medical problems that uh, are engaging rather than the unfortunate patients they're attached to. We've had a patient who's not quite got um, perianal Crohn's. Now, you say, well, why do you say not quite? Because we haven't made the diagnosis yet. And this is part of... Crohn's disease, it's a difficult thing to make that diagnosis eventually because you say, you know, we need to think about it with a patient who's commenting of diarrhea, they're commenting of abdominal pain, they're commenting of mouth ulcers, they're a little bit tired. That's going to cover an awful lot of patients. However, if we're going to add in and bleeding from the back passage, that makes that diagnosis much easier. But that final bit, the, the clincher, bleeding from the back passage, doesn't come very early on for a lot of patients. And this is the guy that I saw this week. He'd been generally unwell, and we'd been generally working him up. We hadn't found anything to properly hang our hats on as a potential diagnosis. And the way... He, he, so he said, when I wanted my third set of blood tests, he said to me, but Doc, you've already had blood tests. Why do you want more? The way I phrase it to patients is that Blood tests is like going to the supermarket. Just because you've gone to the supermarket, if, you didn't, if someone didn't ask you to bring the milk, you won't have done. You have to ask for specific things to be looked for in the bloods. And there are specific things for Crohn's that we look for, but they're expensive tests, so we're not going to do them on every patient that has diarrhoea. Otherwise, we'd bankrupt the NHS. So this guy had been generally under the weather, and he came in to say, I've got a really painful backside now. I think there's, you know, there's something there and there's a bit of discharge. It's, it's very nasty. And when we looked, he got a sore right next to his anus. So he got his, you know, his butthole was there and there was an area of discharge right next to it. And that 
unfortunately for me, was another, oh no, I've got another brick in the wall, is this guy got Crohn's. And we've looked at him, we've, we've done the workup. Unfortunately, I've got some uh, markers that have come back positive, And we now need to have a look at this lesion he's got. Is it a sore, and is it just there, we can sort that? Or is it perhaps more worrying? Is it that his bowel has become inflamed, that there's a hole in his bowel, and that hole has steadily gone through the skin and has now come out on the other side? So there's two passageways. Again, we can deal with that, but it's much harder to do. It's called a fistula, isn't it, when that happens? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the way we treat a fistula is, it sounds bizarre. It's called a, uh, with a, something called a seat on, where we get the surgeons, they anaesthetise the patient, and we put a piece of string through this hole to work as an irritant to cause fibrosis and for that seat, that uh, fistula to close. But that's going to take weeks and weeks to happen. And we do it with that way rather than stitching it up, for example, because the tissue becomes so irritable and friable, just like the rest of the bowel does. If we tried to put um, sutures to it, it would probably fall apart. So we need the body to heal itself by the irritation from this string. Tell me more about the investigation of Crohn's. You mentioned blood tests. Is it just blood tests? What are those blood tests and what other tests are done? So to start off, let's assume we've got a patient that's tired all the time. We have a specific tired all the time screen. We want to know what's their iron level. You know, are there any markers of inflammation? Do they have a raised white cell count? Are their kidneys and liver functioning well? That's a straightforward screen. But assuming we're going to find out this patient has Crohn's, we might find that they've got a low iron level, their haemoglobin, their HB is down. doesn't matter what the age of the patient is. If somebody's HB is down, I need to be able to give an answer as to why that is. So we have to look further. And with that, the next question is, are they not absorbing things, which could happen with Crohn's because it's affecting the stomach, it's affecting their ability to take up nutrition, or are they losing it somewhere? Is it further down that they're leaking blood into the bowel? So at that point, I'd ask the patient for a sample of poo. Um, we'd normally give a blue top bottle with a little shovel on the bottom. The patient can work out what to do with the shovel. They bring that back and we send it off to the lab to see if they can see any blood in it that may be so microscopically small the patient hasn't picked up on it yet. If we've got those two things, I'm going to think, right, this could quite likely be Crohn's. So I'm going to do some specific tests now to see whether or not we've got inflammation there in terms of the antibodies. So we'll look for markers of inflammation. And if we found those, if all of my history looks like it's uh, Crohn's disease, and I've got markers of saying this thing has got inflammation, we then need to put a camera at the patient's back passage, and possibly down their mouth, different cameras there, um, to find out what's going on inside. But presumably you wouldn't do that in your general practice. How would you organise a camera that way or a camera that way? Well, actually, it depends. There are some uh, GP surgeries that have um, a sigmoidoscope, so a really short camera that lets us get the first part of the bowel, which is really useful because it can be done in the general practice and relatively quickly. But there's an awful lot of bowel, so we're not going to get very far with the camera that much big. But if that gives us the answer, it doesn't matter if the rest of the um, uh, GI system is affected, we can take that answer. If we haven't, though, then we can end up having a colonoscope and we'll go all the way round, which would have to be done by the teams in the hospital. And viewers out there, um, it's, I think it's important to get through to the patients that uh, neither the endoscope going that way or the colonoscope going that way is in any way an unusual test. These are now routine tests in Western medicine. Almost all hospitals in the world have had them. And in fact, I've had three colonoscopies and I can tell you they're not that bad. I prefer a colonoscopy any day than going to the dentist. We're not there yet, but I think it could be possible that at some point we actually see screening coming in in the UK. After the age of 50, you have a colonoscope. I don't, we're not there yet, but I could see that happening as it, the technology becomes easier and cheaper. But our colonoscope's only going to go to here. And as I said, Crohn's could be mouth to anus. So what happens if we can't get this middle bit? 
Well, and this goes back to my sister here, we have a pill camera and you can have a patient swallow a very expensive camera it goes and it goes down all the way. They wear, a, they wear a belt so it can transmit signals out to the patient. It goes all the way through, taking a picture every couple of seconds. And then there's a poor consultant has to look through all this stack of images to see, are there inf areas of inflammation in the bowel? Can we make the diagnosis from that? Anyway, James, we're going to talk about the etiology of Crohn's. What causes Crohn's? We don't know. It is an autoimmune disease. And there appears to be a bit of a genetic component. Now, I say it appears to be in the sense that families seem to seem to have a, co a correlation. My father has a dicky tummy. My sister has a known diagnosis. But there isn't a key, right, you have this, you have Crohn's disease test for us yet. That's very interesting. So tell me a little bit more about the treatment of Crohn's. Are there any effective treatments? Yes, there are, um, and some of them are better than others. So when we talk about inflammation, we steroids automatically come out of the uh, cupboard. Steroids are a great medication. They are a huge hosepipe of water for inflammation. However, like hitting a burning house with a big hosepipe, you'll put out the fire. You're quite likely going to damage the china with that hosepipe as well. So steroids are our mainstay of this patient's got a flare, hit them with steroids, bring the inflammation down, stop the bleeding, you know, heal these ulcers. But if we do that time and time and time again, we can run into other problems with those steroids, you know, diabetes, weight gain, problems with the skin for one. So we do have other medications that we try and keep Crohn's at bay once we've used that steroid to suppress it as hard as we can. And those medications are all right. Again, particularly from my sister's point of view, you're not going to get me to sit here and say, we've got this great Crohn's medication. They're all all right. And if those oral medications don't prove to be all right, then we can get the brainiacs out and we can get some really complicated medicine going on using antibodies. And we have two types. We've got human antibodies, which just look like ours. And then we also have antibodies, which we've derived from a mouse with a bit of a change on the end to make them acceptable to the body. And they work to suppress our own body attacking the bowel, hopefully letting it heal and allowing us to restart the process. So are those drugs called biological agents, is that the name for them? So yeah, they're biological agents, but we also have biosimilars, which I think is largely to do with getting around copyright, uh, to make the drugs cheaper, but essentially we're talking about us in labs making antibodies that will lock on to specific, well, the antibodies have a lock and key mechanism and they will lock on to things in the body to stop that immune response. So it sounds like there are effective drugs out there now. Certainly when I was a student, biological agents didn't exist and I saw several patients with really uh, bad and uncontrolled Crohn's on steroids and other drugs with toxic side effects. So it sounds like progress has been made, but aren't those drugs expensive? They are, but um, in the UK we have what are called quality adjusted life years, which sounds far too technical as far as I'm concerned. I just want to treat my patients. But essentially, every patient has a pot of money. And if we can fix them in a year for that amount of money, then we will actually save money. So yeah, we do give very expensive drugs to Crohn's, but that's because we want to avoid operations. And between 50 and 80% of people used to need operations for Crohn's. Now I go back to saying we've got Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. If things fall apart with ulcerative colitis, when the buck stops, we just cut out the bowel. Without the bowel, it can't become inflamed anymore. So we have an endpoint there. We don't have an endpoint with Crohn's, which is why we want to throw everything possible at these patients to prevent an operation. Because every operation with a Crohn's patient might lead to another operation and might lead to another. And it's a very unpleasant cycle to get into that we, we strive 
to try to avoid. But nonetheless, aren't there patients that break through these clever and expensive drugs and need operations? Absolutely, absolutely. And if so, what type of operation might they need? So what we often look at doing is, let's assume that you've had Crohn's for years and years and years, and it's become, inf part of your, your bowels become inflamed, and it's become sore, and it's scarred. Actually, getting rid of this bit of, you know, old useless bowel actually isn't probably going to affect you in terms of being able to absorb nutrition and being able to lead your life and actually getting rid of this duff bit of bowel might mean that you have control again that you stop bleeding your iron levels go up so we take that disease bit of bowel out and we hope that we're then able to restart using the medications to prevent that same thing happening elsewhere and when that happens we may be able to join the bowel up we may end up having to put a bag in place, um, having a stoma, allowing part of the bowel to rest. There's lots of things that we can do. It may seem that a, a stoma, a colostomy or an ileostomy is a terrible thing, but um, they can be very important and very effective. One of my friends um, has a father who at the age of 30 developed osteoarthritis, colitis, and this was pre-biological agents. And within a couple of years, he'd had a couple of operations and really wasn't doing very well. And then his surgeon and his gastroenterologist offered him a colectomy, in other words, to take out the whole bowel and give him a colostomy. And he said, yes, please, and do it tomorrow. And anyway, I asked him one day, I said, how do you feel now about that decision? You've had a colostomy your whole life. And he said to me, Andy, the best decision I ever made. I've had a really good life. I've got a job, I've got a profession, I've got children, and it's all because I had a colostomy and the UC went away. And I think the reason why when people have successful colostomies, they are so positive about them is it gives them control back of their life. For people at home, if you've got a nice functioning bowel, you don't really think about it until perhaps when you have diarrhoea, and then you really pay attention to how something you rely on so often is offline at that moment. Now imagine that that diarrhea is your life. You don't have good control over your bowels. It affects your ability to go to work, to socialize, to see friends, to go out for a date necessarily. And for us with normal bowels, thinking cutting some of out seems a huge step. But actually, if you cut out the bit that is controlling your life, you get control back instead. And so many people are so pleased to have had that big operation because of the benefits they get from it. So that's our information overload on Crohn's. As I say, it's uh, something that we see a lot in my household. So uh, hopefully people have learned a little bit there. And if it's something that you're concerned about, again, I go back to that whole feeling tired, having diarrhea, and just, you know, abdominal pain. If you're suffering from those a lot, go talk to your doctor because the sooner we get you know, to you, the sooner we can do some help.